welcome to the UNC Coastal Studies Institute. I, I take it most of you have been here before. If not, maybe you can wander around and look at some of the rooms. Um, I'm, I'm Jeff Lewis. I'm the horticultural specialist. And my program tonight is on sustainable plants for coastal gardens. And I don't know how that Rebecca got over top of my N and my S. <laughs> and um, we will have a question and answer period at the end. So just, just save your questions for later. Thanks so much for coming out. I told you I had a gift for the people that sat on the front row. Oh, boy, dinner. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, what is a sustainable plant? Let me find my remote control here. A, a sustainable plant or a self-sustaining plant is a plant that is um, well adapted to the local climate and growing conditions. And here on the Outer Banks, we've really got some local climate and growing conditions. Um, it's, a, it's a plant that has to be able to take our high temperatures and our higher humidity, our soils, which are mostly sandy, the salt, whether it's um, from flooding or from salt, wind, salt air, and also the wind, the strong winds, which I'm learning about from working out here um, about what, a, what an influence they can have on plants. Um, a sustainable plant is a plant that requires little or low maintenance, which is good. Um, little or no watering once established, that's a key word there. Some plants um, take a while to get established. You may have to water them at first. Um, no synthetic fertilizer needs and little or no pruning required. Pruning is optional. And um, no pesticides are needed. Um, sustainable plants are resistant to most pests and diseases. Now, you've got to understand that a caterpillar or a grasshopper chewing on a leaf is okay. Doesn't mean there's never a hole in your plants, but there's nothing, they don't, um, sustainable plants, which are mostly native plants, are resistant enough that they just keep on going. Now, and I'm not including deer either. Okay, so a sustainable plant, in short, is a plant that is well suited for the habitat in which it is placed, one that sustains itself and lives in harmony with the environment around it. In short, a species that will thrive after you plant it. You can go around and brag of what a green thumb you have. <clears throat> um, I've got a few shrubs and then some perennials and some perennial vines, and that's how, that's how we're going to go here. <clears throat> um, the first three plants here are going to be the least exciting, so bear with me. But they're important plants here on the Outer Banks. The eastern red cedar, or red cedar, or cedar, which is really a juniper. Um, they grow all over the place here. They're very salt tolerant. They can grow in just about any of our soils. Um, wind and salt tolerant. They make a great screen. You can plant them to, to, for, as a screen to prevent that salt air from getting in where it doesn't need to, to, um, to get. Um, they are slow growing though, so it'll take a while, but it's a great plant. They're evergreen. They provide a lot of cover for wildlife, and they, they produce these blue seed cones in the fall slash winter that the birds really like. And they're just completely no to low maintenance. <coughs> and then this was supposed to drop in, okay, and they do make a nice tree too. They're technically a tree, I think. Okay, Yopon Holly. He did it again. Okay. I'll figure this thing out. Yopon holly, Ilex vomitoria. This is a yellow berry when you're all familiar with them. They normally have red berries. But this is another really good native um, screen shrub for our area. It'll take um, average to moist soil, sun or light shade. Um, it's drought, wind, and salt tolerant. It's evergreen with berries for the wildlife. It's very low maintenance. And you can grow it as a shrub. You can plant it and forget it, and it'll end up being a big shrub. You can prune it to be a tree, or you can actually grow it to be a hedge. And those are the normal red berries, and those are some birds enjoying them. Okay, wax myrtle. This is another really good one. We've got them right out in the planter in front of the building here. You may have noticed them. Um, real easy to grow. They grow fast, so you don't have to wait forever to create this screen. Um, they can take dry or moist soil, rich or poor soils, sun or shade. And they're very tolerant of our Outer Banks conditions. Um, they have this really good smelling foliage. The foliage is real um, 
real fragrant. And then they, they um, produce these waxy gray bayberries in the winter that some of the birds like to eat. So it's a great plant. You can't really prune them to shape. You can, but they grow so fast it grows right back out of it. In fact, the ones planted in front of the building here came in and were, they were actually tree formers when they arrived and were planted. It didn't, didn't take them long to go back to their um, native shape, normal shape. All right, a little more color. This is American Beautyberry. You're probably all familiar with it. This is, a, this is more of a shade plant. They'll grow, in, they'll grow in shade to part sun. They'll grow in full sun, but it's a little bit harsh for them. They prefer at least a little bit of shade. Um, average soils, they're a little bit, you know, somewhat drought, uh, drought tolerant once they get established. Um, they're very low maintenance. You, you really don't have to do anything to them. If they get too big, because they can get to eight or ten feet big, if they, um, if they get too big, you can cut them back. You can even cut them back hard down to the ground and they'll sprout back out. But other than, other than uh, that, there's just no maintenance at all. And they produce these yummy purple berries. They're actually edible for humans, too. These yummy purple berries that a few species of birds really love, the catbird and the black or blue warbler, or two of them. And they do come in white. Occasionally, you can find one with white berries. <clears throat> uh, Virginia sweet spire, which is Itea. Um, it likes average to moist soils. It tolerates wet areas. Here at CSI, we've got this one planted in our pollinator garden. It's kind of high and dry. And then we have several more that are planted in our, in our wetlands, in our rain gardens. They're planted, they're planted in the moist soil where they're part, some of the year they're covered with water, some of the year they're not, and they're doing fine. So moist to wet areas are best. Average garden soils will work, but then you're going to have to water them from time to time. Um, full to partial sun, um, even a little bit of shade is fine. And they grow to about eight feet tall, although I've never seen one that tall. They have these fragrant white flowers in late spring and early summer. They just finished blooming here. And they have nice red autumn foliage. And they also are a great pollinator plant. And little or no maintenance, like I say, unless you plant them in too dry an area, then you're going to have to water them. Um, sweet pepper bush, this clethra, um, is a native plant. You can find it all over the alligator refuge and other places along the, the ditch banks and in wet areas. Um, it's, it's a great, great plant. Likes, it likes moist soils, um, full to partial sun. Also, it also supposedly grows to 10 feet, but I've never seen one. They're usually about 5 feet or so tall. And they do spread to form these nice big colonies. They have these really nice fragrant flowers in summer that attract lots of insects, lots of bees and wasps and butterflies. So it's a great pollinator plant. And I cannot think of any maintenance you would ever have with these plants. Surely there's something, but I don't know what it is. I guess you have to plant them initially. That's not really, that's not really maintenance, though. Um, but it's a, it's a great plant. We've, um, I've added them in several places on the campus here. They're, they're still, you know, Fairly small. They're going to bloom this year, but they're not going to be impressive for another year or two. But, but these are really great plants. Um, button bush. This is just kind of a personal favorite. I've always liked these little balls. It's also called honey bells. It's uh, Cephalanthus occidentalis. It's another nice native shrub. You can find it on alligator refuge. This one was on the, on the bank of a canal. You can see the reflection in the water. They're blooming right now, this time of year right now, and they like full to part sun. They're deciduous. They can reach 10 feet in size, um, in height, but you can cut them back if you need to if they get too big. But they have these fragrant white blooms that atta attract lots of pollinators, especially butterflies. I see, I see more butterflies on them than anything. But um, they have really no maintenance. unless, Like I say, unless they get too big, out of shape, you want to cut, cut them back, you certainly can. And they're fragrant. Here's a, just another picture of eastern tiger swallowtail enjoying one of them. Okay, perennials. Coreopsis, um, or tick seed, you may know it by. Um, really, really easy plant to grow. Um, average to dry soils. They're very drought tolerant. They're, they're really just indestructible. You can walk on them and they'll just spring back up. Um, full to partial sun. They're short-lived perennials, but they... they self-sow 
in vast quantities. They really put lots of seeds out. <clears throat> they form these large colonies. <clears throat> they have these yellow flowers like you see here in spring and summer, which attract lots of pollinators, lots of bees and butterflies. <clears throat> now, like I've already said, there's just, there's, there's virtually no maintenance. Um, if, you, if you have a small patch, you can deadhead them to keep them blooming, but I can't deadhead this. Did, did, did any of you get out? Did you, any of you get out about a month ago and see these flowers when they were at their peak? If you didn't, if you didn't see our campus a month ago, you need to uh, mark your calendar for next year. This was 17th of May. It's just amazing, all the yellow. Um, Gallardia, known as um, blanket flower, Indian blanket, Joe Bells, Firewheel, different different common names. Gallardia is. Um, well known on the Outer Banks. I mean, they'll grow right behind the primary dunes, right in the sand, right over the dunes. So they're extremely tolerant of our tough conditions, um, our sand and wind and salt and drought conditions. Very easy to grow. It's, a, um, it's another short-lived perennial that sows, you know, sows tremendously, lots of seeds, so they usually just keep on coming. And they bloom, have a long bloom season, um, spring through fall. In fact, this photo was taken on 18th of November last year, so it was still going strong last November. So, I mean, a plant that blooms from spring to fall is a good thing. They're very easy to grow. And here are some, here are some uh, pollinators on some flowers. I don't know what would happen if you plant them in good, rich soil. It'd probably kill them. <clears throat> um, this plant is dotted horse mint, Monarda punctata. It's really, really fragrant. When I'm, when I'm out mowing or string trimming or just walking, if I hit a patch of it, I get this nice spicy fragrance that comes up. Um, I, di I, I did some research though, and even though you can make tea with the leaves, I don't recommend it after reading about it. As long as you make a really, really weak tea, you're okay, but it's, this plant is used medicinally or has been in the past, and so it might do things to you. If you <laughs> so just leave this one alone. But it does, it smells like something, you, it smells like something you'd want to make tea with. Anyway, it's, it's really drought tolerant. It's, um, it's a really tough plant. Like I said, you can mow it down and walk on it, it doesn't hurt it. Um, it, it, like, it prefers average to dry, prefers average to dry sandy soil. So that's a good thing around here. Prefers as much sun as you can give it. Um, it does spread to form nice big clumps. It's a great pollinator plant and just no maintenance at all. And the, the flower is really, flower is really impressive, really complicated, intricate looking. And this is, um, these are our new signs. We just put signs in our new pollinator garden. Um, <clears throat> wild bergamot, this is another Monarda, like the last one was, and they're both in the mint family. This one, this one you can use the leaves to make a tea with, supposedly safe. Um, this has the lavender blue flowers in the summer. It attracts lots of pollinators, lots of butterflies, bees, and hummingbirds too. It likes average to dry soils. It's somewhat drought tolerant. Um, it's, it spreads by rhizomes, so it makes a bigger and bigger clump as well. So it, it's um, just a very, very easy plant. Turn you into a green thumb overnight. Um, milkweed, butterfly weed, one of the Asclepius, there's a lot of Asclepius species. This is the one that everybody wants these days for the monarchs. It's an easy plant to grow. It's very drought tolerant and will grow in average to dry soils. Sometimes when you're planting the little ones, they, they take a while to get going. Sometimes you, the small ones are kind of easy to kill, but once you find the right spot and get a plant that, will, that likes that spot and starts growing, then it's a really tough, durable plant. Um, <clears throat> has the, it has these orange summer to fall blooms that attract lots of insects, lots of pollinators, bees and flies and butterflies. But the main thing, the main reason people are wanting it these days is because it's the host plant for the monarch butterfly, which means the monarch lays its eggs on the plant and the eggs eat your plant up and have the caterpillars, I mean the, the caterpillars eat your plant up. So, um, so don't, don't take your plant back to the nursery and say you want to return it because the caterpillars are eating it up. That's what it's there for. That's happened. <clears throat> and, and once it's established, there's virtually no maintenance to this plant. 
Um, there's also, uh, there are several milkweeds. There's also, this milkweed is a native to this area that's good for wet areas. So if you happen to have a, a pond or a marsh or a ditch in your yard, you want to plant some native plants in. Um, this swamp milkweed with the pink flowers is completely maintenance free once you plant it. When you plant, you know, when you plant um, native plants in the water or in moist areas, you don't have to even water them in. You plant them and just stand back, you're done. Just all you have to do is enjoy them. So this is another one that the monarchs can lay their eggs on and grow their larvae. You see all the butterflies. The butterflies really like this plant. What kind of butterflies are those? Those are little <coughs> tiny pearl crescents on the, in the left-hand picture, and that's a Palamedes swallowtail in the right-hand picture. And these are, you, you can usually find these, if you look hard enough, find the, I mean, in the, in the trade to, to purchase, and they come in white also. Goldenrod. Goldenrod's a great plant. Um, I don't think, I think everybody knows by now that it's not an allergen. That used to be the, that used to be the big word was that goldenrod's making me, my allergies act up. It's not really goldenrod. Goldenrod's are just, just a marvelous plant. I mean, what other plant is just covered, smothered, covered in clusters of yellow flowers in the fall? And it's tolerant of dry to moist soils. It's very drought tolerant. It's very salt tolerant, wind tolerant. In other words, Outer Banks tolerant. Um, um, has these, like I said, has the yellow blooms in summer and fall. There are lots of different varieties, species, cultivars. Um, some are tall, some are short. It attracts lots of pollinators, including, um, including the monarchs. The monarchs don't lay their eggs on it. It's just a, a nectaring plant for monarchs. It also attracts lots, attracts lots of beneficial insects, which are insects like ladybugs and other things that prey on pests. So it's a good plant to have around your garden, too. Um, provides food and cover for the birds, and there's just virtually no maintenance required. So it could, it'll grow. And we, and we have a lot of seaside goldenrod here along the ocean, um, which is what this is. It's toler tolerant of sand or occasional flooding. So what more could you ask? If it wasn't native to this country, we'd be all crazy about it. Um, and the seaside, I learned recently the seaside goldenrod plants growing along our beaches are very important to the migrating monarch butterflies. You know, when they migrate through this area in the fall, they're mostly along the seashore. And if you go out to Pea Island, you can see them out there in, in big flocks sometimes. And they do love this um, seaside goldenrod. Um, spiderwort, Tradescantia, this is a, a, nice, a nice plant for your perennial border. Nice uh, blue to purple flowers. In spring and summer, they attract pollinators. Um, it, it's fine in just average soils. It's somewhat drought, drought tolerant once it gets established. Um, full sun to light shade. And um, I'll say this is low maintenance because you can cut it back in summer after it's finished blooming. It's looking kind of bedraggled. You can just cut it back and it'll come back up and bloom again. Um, Black eyed Susans. There are so many of these Rebecca, I'm, I'm sort of lumping them together here. Um, they're very popular with gardeners, so, which means they're readily available in the market. You can buy them just about anywhere. But um, Black Eyed Susans are, are, are fairly um, easy to grow in, in any average soil or moist soil. They're fairly drought tolerant once they're established. They like as much sun as you can give them. And they have a really long blooming period. They bloom from, you know, from late spring until mid-fall. And if you deadhead them, they'll bloom a little longer. Um, they're, they're a good pollinator plant. Um, I started growing this one a year or two ago. Kathy Mitchell turned me on to it. Is she here? And um, I really like this brown-eyed Susan. It it's a, makes a nice clump. They're, they're kind of smaller, rounder flowers, but they're real pretty. And I planted a whole lot of these at CSI, but I grew them from seed this winter, so they're still fairly tiny. But just wait till next year. Um, cut leaf coneflower, I've been growing this one for 20 some years. This is a really tall one, um, really good for the back of your border, perennial border, but it's real easy, real indestructible. In fact, it'll, it, will, it will be a pass along plant after a few years because it'll, it'll grow beyond its bounds and you can dig it up around the edges and share it with your neighbors. But it's a really great, um, really great plant. It's called cut leaf coneflower, but it's really a rudbeckia, it's not an echinacea. And um, this plant grows prolifically from the coast all the way to the mountains. If you grow up to the mountains, it's up there too. 
pollinators really like it. It's also called green-headed coneflower, something like that. Um, blazing star, the Atris piccata. Um, it's, this is a really nice plant. It, it's got that nice vertical texture and it's got pretty flowers. Does well around here um, in average to moist soils. It's fairly drought and salt tolerant. It's maybe not like some of the others, but fairly drought tolerant once it gets established. It likes full to partial sun. You know, the spikes are maybe three feet tall. They get pretty big. Um, has the purple blooms in summer. They've just started blooming around here. We've got them, um, got a few right outside the front door here. Um, they have, the, like I said, they have that nice vertical texture, and the foliage itself is even attractive. Even when it isn't a bloom, it has attractive foliage. And speaking of attraction, it attracts butterflies, moths, bees, and hummingbirds. And it's it's fairly no fairly low maintenance. Um, you can deadhead them, but um, that's about the only thing I know to do that you can do with them. There, and there are other really nice Liatris species, but this is really the only one you ever see commonly in the trade. If you, get, if you go to a nursery somewhere, this is about the only one you'll ever find. <clears throat> Rattlesnake master, this is one of the Eryngiums. This is a um, native, it's kind of like a yucca. This is, this is um, it's called um, yucca folium, Eryngium yucca folium. The foliage is kind of like a yucca, kind of spiky and long and sort of blue-green, um, nice, nice color foliage. And then it sends up these little shoots that have these white, white kind of bluish-white spiky flowers. And um, it's just kind of an interesting plant. And um, it attracts lots of, lots of little bugs and butterflies. And it's very low maintenance. Um, you, you don't want to move it, though. It doesn't transplant very well. It's in the parsley slash carrot family. So it, it resents transplanting. So pick your spot and leave it there. And they, they, they grow, they make a bigger and bigger clump each year. So after a few years, you've got a really nice specimen. We have another one. I, I, this one's prettier. I like the flower on this one better. This one's for the wet areas. This is Marsh Rattlesnake Master, Eryngium aquaticum. So that's self-explanatory there. Um, it's great for moisture wet areas. And we planted both of these in our new pollinator garden. We've got this one up in the high dry area and this one down by our little wetland there. Um, so it's great for wet areas, full to partial sun. It has the, the same attractive silver green foliage and the silvery blue flowers. It attracts lots of native bees and flies and beetles and butterflies. And it's low maintenance in moist areas. It would not be low maintenance if you plant it in a dune <clears throat> um, and I already, the, the note here at the bottom, I've already told you that. These are very difficult plants to tr plant, transplant. So once you plant it, um, leave it there. And they do, they do seed also. Um, blue wild indigo or blue false indigo, Baptisia australis. This is a nice native plant for average soils. It's somewhat drought tolerant. Um, it likes full sun to part shade. It has these pretty blue, blue-purple flowers in spring and summer. Um, spreads by rhizomes, so it'll make a bigger and bigger clump for you. It also does not transplant well. It has these thick roots. Um, it's a good pollinator plant, very low maintenance. It's definitely something you want in your garden. It's a really beautiful plant. And there are some other um, Baptisia species in eastern North Carolina that are also just as good. There's a yellow one and a white one, but you, they're just hard to find. And when they finish blooming, they, the, where the flowers were, they develop these pale green seed pods, and then they turn brown, but the seed pods are even attractive. Asters, I decided just to lump asters together. They've been studying asters for years now, and they're renaming them all, and, and most, most of the ones that used to be Aster something, aren't even aster something anymore. So I'm just going to lump them all together and say all these aster plants that plants formerly known as asters, they're great plants. They're, um, they're typically um, fairly drought tolerant. In you know, they're like average to moist soils, but typically fairly drought tolerant. They bloom at a good time of the year. They bloom fairly late in the year when other plants are kind of fizzling out. You know, they, grow, they come in blues and lavenders and whites. Um, these are two of my favorites, though. The one on the left is called Aromatic Aster, and I like it just because it's a little bit lower. Everything seems to be tall, and it's, it's nice to have something low that'll 
go in the front of your perennial border. So the aromatic aster there, and it's available um, at least through mail order companies. And then the one on the right is the Carolina aster or climbing aster or climbing Carolina aster. Um, that's native to this area. And it doesn't really climb, but it, it sort of trails. You can, as long as you can find a trellis or something to weave it around, then it's a, a climbing aster. But they both attract lots of butterflies and both very low maintenance. Once you're established, you don't have to do anything to them. And most of them will self-sow too. This is not an aster, Stokes aster. Um, this is a Stokesia. Um, it's a great plant, um, very low maintenance. <clears throat> it's um, got a real big, pretty flower, and there, it's, it's a good plant if you're perennial border. It'll grow in just average soils. Um, the, one, the picture on the left is actually from my yard. I didn't plant it there. It's been there for as long as I can remember, 15 or 20 years. That plant's been just in the yard. It's not in a bed. It's just sitting there in the yard. I've, I don't ever water it. don't ever do anything to it. I did cut some blooms off last fall so I could grow some from seeds for CSI. So we've got quite a few planted here now. They're just, just waiting on them to grow. But you can grow them by seeds. You can divide them um, or you can just buy them. But they're, they're great. They're, there are cultivars available if you want a different color. There's some slightly different colors, but such a beautiful plant. But they like um, full sun to partial shade. And about the only maintenance I can possibly think would be you can cut them back after they finish blooming to try to encourage them to bloom some more. That's about the only thing, though. Um, wild ageratum. You probably have been buying ageratum at at nurseries for years, the domestic, the domestic form. This is the wild one. If you drive around Alligator Refuge in late summer, early fall, or some of the other wet areas around here, you'll see this growing along the ditch banks and on the shoulders of the road. It likes moist soils best. It's just a real pretty, um, quickly spreading, kind of a ground cover, kind of a tall ground cover. Um, grows to two or three feet tall. It's a great pollinator plant. You see all kinds of bugs on it. And it's just very low maintenance. It does like moist soil, but it's just very low maintenance. So we've got that planted out here too. We'll see how it does out here. That's just a close up of the blooms. Swamp sunflower or narrow leaf sunflower. You can see the narrow leaf. You can see how it's got these real pretty, the real pretty narrow foliage. And um, then in, the, um, in, in late summer and fall, by then they're usually eight feet tall and they get these pretty yellow sunflowers on them and they bloom for a, a fairly long time. Um, you can keep them shorter by cutting them back. Maybe midsummer you can cut them down. And actually this, this left-hand picture was taken in, the pollinator, in our pollinator garden. And this front plant here was just a spike like the other ones behind it. And I cut it off about two weeks ago and it's already really bushed out. See how nice and bushy this plant's gotten? So that's definitely the thing to do, to cut them back. So what I'm gonna do is, is leave that one and leave those there as they are, and I may take another one in another area. I may cut it back in a couple of months, and it's kind of, so I can compare, get firsthand knowledge of, of when to cut them back and how much to cut them back. But um, even though they, they're called swamp sunflower and they like moist soil, they're doing really well out here in the, in the dry areas. We have them up, up on top of the hills in this dry, sandy soil, and they're, they're doing just great. So I would say you can grow them just about anywhere. They're salt tolerant. Um, they, like, they like all the sun you can give them. They do like sun. They're a sunflower. Um, they're easily divided, and they, they produce lots of seeds. And you can leave the seeds for the birds. You also can plant some, and also they'll sow themselves by falling on the ground. And they attract butterflies and bees, so they're good pollinator plants. Um, cardinal flower, Lobelia cardinalis. <clears throat> this is a nice um, late summer, fall blooming plant. Sometimes you'll see it along the canal banks over on the mainland. It's um, actually a very easy plant to grow in moist soil, and you can grow it in average garden conditions, but you, you, you may have to keep an eye on it in case you have a real drought. You may have to water it. But it's a great plant, really pretty red flowers, likes full sun to shade. Um, the flowers attract 
hummingbirds big time, and then they attract a few um, butterflies. And about the only maintenance you would ever have to do on them is if you want to deadhead them, you can. And then they'll, if you, if you cut this off, where's the stem? If you cut this off when it's just about through blooming, it'll send some little side shoots out and it'll bloom, bloom again. Some little short spikes will bloom. But the hummingbirds just love this plant. So it's worth having just for hummingbirds. And they actually do real well in a container too. You can grow, I had, one, I had a big one in a container for years and years. And then if you're a photographer, you can move it where the light's just right, and you can just get your chair out and your camera and wait for the hummingbird to come along. <clears throat> um, Joe Pawee, this, is, uh, this has been a favorite of mine for a long, long time. You see this blooming in the ditches in, in late summer and fall. It's a real tall plant. Most of it, usually they're five or six feet tall. So they prefer moist soils. They actually do okay in a, in a regular garden situation. They do okay, as long as it isn't a really, really dry garden. And they've changed the name on these two. These were always eupatoriums, and I still try to call them eupatoriums. Now they're eutrochiums. And the one with the asterisk after, after it, the purpurium, is um, one of the species that does okay with a little bit less sun, a little bit more shade. So that's, that's a little bit, that may be better for the home garden than the other ones if you're gonna, gonna try to plant them in a dry area. Um, so they do prefer moist soils. They like full to partial sun. They're big, tall, clump-forming plants. So every year, they're going to get more and more beautiful. You're going to have more and more flowers. And they're, like I said, they're good for the back of the perennial border for two reasons. One, because they're taller than probably the plants in the front. But also, those plants in the front will help hold them up. So that's good, too. And they track many species of insects, um, all kinds of bugs, including butterflies. A lot of people don't like the bug word. Very low maintenance. Here's an eastern tiger swallowtail enjoying one of them. <clears throat> and the flower heads um, in the late fall, winter, turn into little heads of seeds, which some of the birds like to eat. So there you have it, an all-around winter. And blooming about the same time of year that the um, jopi blooms, and in the same areas, is New York ironweed, or just ironweed. And um, it's a very tough plant, hence the name ironweed. And um, I think I like this one even better than Joe Pye. This has deeper, more purple flowers. Uh, but it gets taller, it gets to seven feet tall. So it's, it's um, definitely a place for the a plant for the back of the border. And it also will form a bigger and bigger clump each year. But it's just really pretty, it attracts lots of butterflies. It blooms in late summer into fall. And what more can I say about it? See, even the foliage is kind of pretty. It's got those narrow leaves. There are a couple of butterflies nectaring on the flowers. Um, red star hibiscus or Texas star hibiscus or scarlet rose hibiscus or scarlet rose mallow. Lots of names for the same plant, hibiscus coccineus. This is a great big, big red flower about this big, big, deep red um, hibiscus grows to usually five or six feet tall. You can grow it in your perennial water. You can grow it right in your regular average soil. It might want water once or twice um, if it gets really, really dry, but it's, it's not a high maintenance plant. It's a low maintenance plant. Um, it does prefer moist soils if you happen to have a moist garden. Um, it's it's um, herbaceous, dries, dries, dries to the ground each year. You can snip a little stalk off if you like but there's very little maintenance for it. Um, it produces these big red flowers followed by these big old seed pods full of big seeds. So you can plant them in different areas or you can just let them fall to the ground. Uh, attracts butterflies and hummingbirds. It's real pretty. It, I beat the heck out of these tropical hibiscus that attract all these bugs and then they die when winter comes anyway. This one doesn't die, it just goes down in the ground and rests and comes back even bigger the next year. This is another, um, you don't see this one in, in the trade much. I mean, you can, you, can buy the, you can buy this one. This one, this one you may have to collect some seeds from the wild and grow them yourself. This is the one you see around here all over the place in the, in the summer, all over, P, there's acres and acres of it at Pea Island. Some are pink and some are white. It's, a, it's um, rose mallow, marshmallow, maybe swamp mallow, lots of common names, hibiscus mosquitoes. 
Um, it likes moist to wet habitats. It can be found in fresh or salt marshes. Gets really tall, up to about eight feet tall, eight feet tall. Um, tracks hummingbirds, bees, and butterflies. And there's a close-up of one of the white ones with a little tiny butterfly in there. I don't know if he's going to nectar or if he's just hiding or something. But like I said, it also comes in um, pink. It's also called crimson-throated mallow or crimson-throated hibiscus. But super low maintenance in moist soils. Um, I wanted to throw a couple of grasses in. Um, purple muley grass, you're probably familiar with this one. If not, you should be. It's a warm season grass that likes average to dry soil, so you don't have to water it. Once it's established, it's fine. It's an it's a attractive green clump of grass, you know, most of the, all, all spring and into the summer. And then, then by late summer and fall, it just turns into purple haze. You know, it blooms and just, it's just really beautiful, especially backlit like this. But these pinkish purple flowers just cover it and it's just gorgeous. It doesn't really attract butterflies and things like that, but it attracts beneficial insects. I don't know why, but it does. Um, and it's, it's a very low season plant. I mean, being a warm season grass, it's one that you would cut back at the end of the winter, right before spring starts. You could cut it back to maybe, maybe eight or 10 inches high. You don't have to, it doesn't, nobody does that out in the wild. It's a native plant, but it'll, it cleans it up and it, it just makes it prettier the next year. So you can, um, you can't quite mow them down, but if you could just cut them back to less than a foot tall. A little blue stem, we've got a lot of this out here on the campus. It's a, it's a nice native plant. It's got this real pretty um, bluish green. It looks more green there, it looks more blue on my, on, on my screen here. It's a nice pretty bluish green color. Gets a couple feet tall, and then it'll bloom with the little white, little white blooms. And then it kind of turns, kind of turns red for the fall, and then eventually it ends up brown. It's a warm season grass, so it's another one you would cut back in the spring. And actually, I do mow these down. They do fine just to mow them down. It just kind of cleans up the spot. If you if you leave them, if you don't cut them back, you just have the new green shoots mixed in with the old brown ones from the year before. So they just look better if you cut them back. But other than that, there's no maintenance to them at all. You don't have to water them. You don't have to do anything. Um, they like to average the dry soils that we have around here. They like full sun. Um, they're drought, drought tolerant. They have seeds the birds like. They're a host plant for one of our little butterflies. I don't remember which one. They also provide, not when you have one clump, but if you have lots of them, they provide good cover for nesting birds and other animals, and they produce seeds that the animals like to eat. So it's a good plant. It's a really good plant. And I'm sorry, but the picture on the right is the only one in this program that isn't mine, so I had to swipe one picture. <laughs> Please don't tell on me. I guess I just did tell myself. Um, I threw a couple ferns into this program as well. One of my very favorite around here, a native fern, is the cinnamon fern. Um, in the spring, they, they form these little fiddleheads, which are pretty cool. And actually, they're edibles. Anyone here eaten fiddleheads before? All right, I think you saw them in butter or something. But anyway, they produce these fiddleheads, and then they start growing, and then they send up these, these cinnamon spikes, which aren't really cinnamon at all, don't eat them. It's the fertile fronds from the, from the fern. Um, cinnamon ferns, though, um, they like moist to wet soils in sun or shade. The more sun you put them in, the more moisture they need to have. They will grow in full, hot, broiling sun if they're in the water, basically. So um, I hope to get them out here at CSI before too long. Um, they have this nice vertical texture. You can grow them right in your perennial border with your perennials if you want to. And they're maintenance free. You don't have to do anything to them. Another really nice fern around here, another nice native fern um, is royal fern. They're related to the cinnamon ferns. They have interesting fiddleheads in the spring. Then they send up these, the, the foliage almost doesn't look like a fern. They have this real, these real pretty leaves. And then they have their own little secret, little special um, fertile frond. And these cannot quite take full sun. These are better in, in um, part sun to full shade. They do like moist to wet areas. And these things will grow up to about five feet tall. But no maintenance is required. 
And I am growing one of these out here in full sun just to see how it'll do. So to be continued. Perennial vines, last but not least. Um, coral honeysuckle. Um, this is our native honeysuckle and it's, it's extremely tolerant of the Outer Banks conditions. You can, you can find it growing right behind the primary dune sometimes, right in the sand, growing all through the other shrubs. And, and it looks like the shrub's blooming red and it's, it's really a vine. Um, they like, um, so they're okay with the dry soil, they're okay with the sand and the wind and the salt. Um, they like full to partial sun. They'll, they'll grow in shade, but they don't, they don't bloom as well in shade. They have these coral red tubular flowers that really attract hummingbirds. And actually, in the end in, of the season, they, they produce these clusters of berries, which the birds like to eat. Bet you didn't know that. Um, they're not invasive like the ex exotic species. Please don't plant this Japanese honeysuckle. It's um, a horrible beast. But these are entirely manageable. They're not um, invasive. They're semi-aggressive growing. They're just the right, they grow right at the right pace. And they're completely maintenance free unless you're going to grow it on a trellis. If you're going to grow it on a tre trellis where it's close to the house, you may have to cut out some dead stems each year. But if you grow it just in the back 40 and let it grow up in the natural, in the other shrubs, then you won't even notice that. And that's just a close up on the right of, of uh, an individual flower. So, what likes tubular flowers? Hummingbirds. Okay, um, Carolina jessamine, which is not a, not a jasmine at all, it's a gelsimium, that's why it's jessamine. Um, <laughs> this is another nice native vine that. Um, Blooms like crazy here in the spring. I've, I've had people ask me before, what are these yellow bushes blooming everywhere? And it's not yellow bushes. It's this Carolina jessamine that's climbed all up and is kind of smothering the bushes. But they're really pretty and they have a really nice fragrant fragrance. Hummingbirds like them a little bit. Same thing with bees and butterflies, a little bit. Um, they are vigorous. And this is more vigorous than the honeysuckle I just showed you. They're not terrible, though. You can, you can, um, you can manage them. But, but average soils are fine. They're very drought tolerant once they're established. They like full to partial sun. Um, and just little to no maintenance at all. Just easy, easy peasy. This one, the cross vine, you might think it's a trumpet vine. It's not. The cross vine, the flower's a little bit smaller than on the regular trumpet creeper vine. And it's a two-tone, red and yellow. They're really pretty. Um, sometimes you miss them because they're up over your head, and if you don't see them laying on the ground where they've fallen off, you'll miss them completely. But they grow, they're native, they grow wild all around the Outer Banks. If you plant this one, be sure you're thinking ahead and planting in a good place. If you plant this one on your house, on, you know, if you've got a little six by six trellis and you think, well, I'm going to plant this there, it's, it might be good for a year or two, but then it's going to want, it's going to want the chimney. So, um, so plant it somewhere like this, plant it where it can grow up a tree, something like that. But it's a wonderful plant to have, if, no, if for no other reason, just to keep the hummingbirds happy. It blooms really heavy in the spring, and then it just kind of sporadically in the summer. But yeah, this one's a little bit, a little bit dangerous. But, it, but you know, no maintenance, not unless you have to move it because you put it in the wrong place. Um, this, is the, this is the real aggressive one, the trumpet creeper vine, Campsis radicans. Um, you see it when you drive, when you're on the highway driving through the country, you'll see it, it'll be covering up an old barn or something, or you'll see it in a tree growing all the way to the top of the tree. But it's a great plant for, for bees and hummingbirds. Um, it, it's, it's very tolerant of drought. It's, it's, it's fine in any soil. It doesn't care about the soil as long as it's got soil. Um, but it has these tubular red, orange, or yellow flowers. And the seed pods even attract birds. The birds will perch on those seed pods and pick the seeds out. So this is a maintenance-free plant unless you can figure the rest out, unless you plant up near the house. You can, you can plant it and it can, be, it can grow for a few years, then you can decide you don't want it and you cut it down and it, it just keeps coming up from underground and it'll, from all over the place. It, takes, it, it may take years to get rid of it, so plant it in the back. And here's a yellow one. Here's a couple more pictures. It's a yellow one and a kind of a reddish one. Plant it in your neighbor's yard. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so.
So, so why? This is kind of just a recap of the first slide. So why do we want these self-sustaining, nice native plants? Because they need very little care, which gives you more free time. They require little or no watering, fertilizing, pruning, or pesticides. And that saves you time and money, money, time, and money, and time. So, um, they're good for the environment. You know, they live in harmony with the environment. They, they're, they're good for all types of creatures from microscopic on up. Um, they attract a variety of animals, including pollinators and birds. Um, they're attractive. They add color to your garden and to your life. So, um, any questions? <clears throat> Don't be shy. If you have a question, wait for the microphone. Ryan there is going to bring the microphone to you. Does that mean you changed your mind, Liz? No, I've seen. I didn't need the microphone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> will the Carolina jasmine, or however how you really say it, will it hurt my dogwoods because it's crawling all over them? Probably not. The thing about native plants versus exotic plants like an exotic plant, like a, like a Chinese wisteria, mm -hmm. that would hurt your tree. Um, these native plants, growing on native plants, pretty much live in harmony. I'm not going to say, a, what was that last one, the trumpet creeper vine? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Probably wouldn't hurt a real strong plant, but um, I, no, I wouldn't worry about that hurting your plant. Now, I mean, if it gets to the point of smothering all the foliage yeah. on said plant, that's not good probably, but you can always snip it back every few years to the ground and let it come out again. Yeah, it does really look pretty. Yeah, they are nice. They are nice and they're very fragrant. Anybody else? Can you get the milkweed by seed? I mean, as commercially. Can you buy seed or buy small plants or what? You can buy, you can buy seed, you can buy plugs of small plants, and you can buy whatever size pot you want. You can buy them in four inch pots. You just, okay. have to check, just have to check the nursery. The, check the local nurseries. If they don't have it, you can order them online. I've, I've given you all, I've, I had a stack of plant sources. This is not something I, I typed up for you all. This is just my plant source list. Because a lot of these nurseries on here are actually wholesale nurseries. So you may not be able to do anything with them. But, but and, and even these nurseries, some of, the, some of these nurseries are strictly native plants. Some are native and exotics. Some are mostly exotics with a few with a few natives. But if you can't find them locally, you can check out some of these online nurseries and see if they're shipping to you. Is that what you're asking? You can grow them from seeds. They're a little bit tricky. Yeah. Um, I, what I did was sowed a whole bunch of seeds in some pots and left them outside all winter long just to do their thing. Plus, I don't have a greenhouse. I've looked for milkweed for years, um, but I've been looking for the plants, and mm -hmm. I've just not been able to find milkweed plants. Well, they seem to be hard. I've seen them locally. I've seen them around the area here okay. locally this year. So, yeah, yeah. And that's why and I was wondering if you could buy them by seed. You can buy the seed, yes. Okay. I, I can't. I've never. I've never purchased seed. I, um, but yeah, you can buy seed. They're, they're not the easiest thing to grow from seed. It takes a while for them to come up, and then they're kind of puny for a while, and they don't want to be underwatered or overwatered. But once they get some sizing, and it gets once it gets hot in the summer, they do really well. It's that cool springtime where they're kind of finicky. But um, if you want to see me afterwards, I'll tell you where, you, where, I, where I bought some. Okay. I don't want to endorse anybody on the air here. <laughs> <clears throat> anybody else? Oh. <clears throat> oh, yeah. uh, what would be a good plant or plants to uh, push out uh, Virginia creeper, uh, cat briar, and uh, grapevines? You mean to outcompete it? Are you out, saying what would be a good Outcompete it, yes. Nothing? No. Yeah, um, no, seriously, um, cat briar, you've got to dig it out. You've got to dig the tubers out. I've dug up, I've dug up clumps that were this big underground. Um, it's really difficult to get rid of it. Um, Virginia creeper, I actually like Virginia creeper, but, but it may be in the wrong place. Virginia creeper is a great fall color plant, great bird plant, but if it's in the wrong place, it can be a nuisance. Um, I don't know anything that can outcompete those. You just, you just got to go through the difficulties of manual extirpation. 
Hi, Priscilla. We have some Carolina jessamine, but it's growing under a live oak tree, and it never blooms, or it'll put out, like, one bloom, I guess, because it's so shady. Could I, like, dig up the whole thing, or be better to do a, to propagate it? You can dig it up. It should be fine. Just wait till it's dormant. You can just wait till it's dormant. Yeah, it's okay. fine. Thank you. So if you, if you didn't get a plant source sheet and you want one, pick up one of my cards and I'll email it to you. Or if you pick up a card anyway, if you want to be in contact with me. And we did have a sign-in sheet. Were there any, any other questions? I didn't see any hands. Oh, there's one. So I'm also... Uh, my backyard abuts uh, part of the Duckwoods uh, Country Club, which has a you know canal watering system. But my backyard, back back forty, attracts and collects and, and stores a lot of water. Uh -huh. um, and in that water patch has grown up tremendously tall Phragmite. Oh, so same thing. Any, anything I can can I plant anything that would compete with that in my backyard? Look out the windows here. Um, <laughs> I, I'm battling. I'm bad. I'm battling Phragmites too, and um, that's probably one of the worst invasive plants to try to get rid of. Um, I mean, if you don't have a really big patch, what, what you uh, well, what what the best thing to do, I guess, to, to get rid of it is, is to get your your Roundup, your glyphosate, and get you a rubber glove, and then put a cotton glove over it, and wipe each blade. And it's very time consuming. I've done it out here. And yeah, you can't, you can't mow it down and get rid of it or chop it up. If you pull it, it breaks. And it likes disturbed areas. So if you start breaking them off, it's just going to go crazy. Um, it's a big problem in this area. And I, and I don't know if at some point it's going to take over the world or not. But <laughs> it's working on it. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'd, I'll take the snakes over the Phragmites any day. <clears throat> God, you guys, these are two. Don't don't give me these kind of problems. I can't help you with Phragmites. <laughs> you need you need an army. Anybody else? Yes, Ann. Oh, you too. If anyone's having trouble with slugs around their pots, that I have big pots outside with plants inside, and I've used club, the, the bait and everything. But then my daughter-in-law went online and discovered chrome wire. You wrap it around the pot and electrocutes them when they crawl up. Whoa. Really? <laughs> yep. I've or you never heard of electrocuting a, a slug. Or you wire down in the plant. <laughs> electrocutes them. You can, you can sprinkle them with salt and watch them do the Wicked Witch of the West. Um, did, did you have a question? I have a hard time putting that out. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. My property's, my property's probably in almost a frontal dune. Uh -huh. um, and I've tried planting yopons, wax myrtles, and bayberries that I've gotten from nurseries. And they all die. Whereas there's native ones that are popping up and colonizing, but they don't do great. But there's, do right. you find that when things are propagated and, and sold in the nurseries, they're really not as strong as the natives? So, sometimes, yes. And there's also, that, there's also that phenomenon where if a plant comes up somewhere on its own, then that's a good spot. It really likes it there. But yes, I mean, it could even be, probably not with the plants you're talking about, but sometimes with plants, if a plant is propagated in New York or Georgia, it may be slightly different from the plant that grows here, so it may not do as well. Um, yeah, that can be a problem. Or, I mean, are there any, <coughs> any nurseries that you recommend that propagate their own? That would be the same type of conditions? You can... Hmm. It was yopons and and what else? Wax myrtles. Wax myrtles. And, and, uh, yeah. Um, talk to me after class. <laughs> Anything else? 
Yes, I'm like, oh. yes, ma'am. I looked out my window today, and I have a small live oak in the backyard, and I have beautiful red flowers in it. Are those the trumpet creeping vines? Most li are they high up or are they low high down? High up, very high up. Probably mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Are they okay to stay? Probably there? so. I mean, an oak tree is pretty pretty strong. Probably okay. Yeah. They're pretty. They are pretty, and hummingbirds like them too. <clears throat> there were some. You don't like this plant? Just to comment on the previous question, we also live very close to the ocean, and plant, having a bird feeder in your garden leads to lots of small there yopon you, coming up. There you up. go. There you go. And they grow very well. We have yep. lots of them. Yopons and poison ivy and all kinds of things get dropped. <laughs> That's why along a fence line or under shrubs, you get all kinds of plants under there. Because the birds bring them. Does anybody else have a question? Um, there is. There was a sign-in sheet. There is a sign-in sheet. If you if you want to be on our our contact list, uh, be sure you sign that. And I. The only handouts I have was the plant source sheet, and then I also had some extra soil sample kit boxes. If you um if you want to take those, you can. There's still a form you have to fill out when, if you mail them in, but you can get the form online. And, and I have some business cards if you want one of those. But um, other than that, thank you so much for coming out. If you have any other questions you want to talk to me personally, just thank you.